Okay, are we live? Yep. Everything's working? Yep. Good afternoon, all of you. Uh, my name is Charles Lord. I'm going to be talking to you for about the next 55 minutes or so. Um, I typically am the speaker at these things right after lunch because they seem to think I'm really good at doing two things, <coughs> excuse me, except for speaking. For two things while we're here, number one is to educate you and excite you about the ideas of entrepreneurship, and second is we just ate lunch. I'm here to keep you awake. Uh, so that's my challenge today. If anybody starts dozing off, I'm going to come start talking to you. We're going to talk about working for yourself. You've heard a lot being said during the talk that we've had today about the whole topic of entrepreneurship, consulting, innovation, and all these great things about going off and working for yourself. It's kind of the American dream. You know, to be the one who has a great invention or to be the one consultant that everybody wants to come to. Trust me, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not. But still, being the one person everybody wants to come to for some particular topic out there. Um, is it everyone suited for it? Unfortunately not. Uh, some of us are better at it than others. Some of us are worse at it than others. Uh, one thing I want you to go ahead and do is in your packet, the white folder in here, you have one sheet that says not everyone is an entrepreneur. This is a worksheet. Uh, it was actually more of a little uh, text that I brought along that supplements the things that we're going to be covering in our slides. But the important thing is on the second page, it has my email address. So if you have any questions after you leave here, if you want to find out more about entrepreneurship, about consulting, about innovation in IEEE Region 3, which is all of the southeast, uh, that's where you are, uh, feel free to contact me. We will also be using some of the URLs that Lee was pointing out on the board up here. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to point out before I start the slides. Uh, people have asked about this online community, the third URL up here. It is a community that you do have to have an IEEE web account in order to access. It's not a wide open account like, uh, say, some Google groups and other types of uh, entities out there. But everyone can request one. You do not have to be an IEEE member to request one. Now, we had one inquiry about, well, I'm a mechanical engineer. Well, we're going to be talking about entrepreneurship and consulting and all phases of engineering. Uh, in my home section, which is up in North Carolina, from the Eastern North Carolina section, I live near Raleigh, we have our local consultants network up there is not just electrical engineers. In fact, it, we're a minority right now. We have more mechanical engineers and designers in our group right now than we do have double A's. And we're okay with that because all of us work together, and it's a great synergy. Another thing I want to mention, because some people have talked about dues here and being unemployed. If you are currently an IEEE member, please, I urge you, not for, on behalf of the IEEE, but for your own benefit, stay with it. It's the best network out there. Every job that I've ever gotten is worth a salt in my 30 plus year career, and I have worked for a lot of companies before I, well, in between times that I worked for myself, Every job that I've gotten has been because somebody knew me and I knew them, period. And all but one were through IEEE. The one that wasn't was through my church. So don't discount any type of social, religious, whatever network of people that know you and you know them because those are the people that you're going to go to. So let's talk for a moment about uh, the real topic that I'm supposed to be talking about. Yes, sir. Thank you. That, you completed my thought. Uh, so that was, that was the point I was leading up to, and I dropped it. Uh, and thank you very much for, for bringing that up. If you are unemployed, and like I said, don't drop your IEEE membership, you can renew for half price, even if you are underemployed. Say if you got laid off, but you're actually working, but not as an engineer, you know, some of us go work at the discount stores at Starbucks or McDonald's or whatever and stuff just to pay the bills, you know, keep the, try to keep the house and the mortgage going. If you made less than, I don't remember what the threshold is, but if you look at the renewal site, there is an exception made for if you have made less than some amount of money and stuff. I, unfortunately, have had to use that in the past. Knock on wood, I will not be having to use that this next year, but we never know on there. Now, who am I to be talking about this? Well, I have my own company. It's called Triangle Advanced Design and Automation, or TADA, or TADA, and that was actually an accident. It wasn't because I was magical or anything out there. I started in 2006 uh, as a PLLC and incorporated in 2008. Why did I do that? I'll talk about that in, in a few moments. I am primarily a consulting practice, but I also do a lot of training. 
I am a specialist in a lot of areas of embedded systems, putting little microcomputers, microprocessors into products and making things work on their own. Um, I've worked in the medical, military, industrial. I have done things as a contractor for NASA, uh, for the, again, for the military, uh, pretty much all government agencies at one time or another. My expertise areas are in Zigbee, which is low-power networking, and also in working with USB. I work with Freescale, Microchip, Renesis, and some other companies out there. I also do work with TI, and I do custom training. I am a professional trainer. I became one about 2006 and you yeah, haven't been able to get me to sit down and shut up ever since. What do I do in IEEE? Well, I actually are one of those people who, even though I have a 30-year career, my IEEE resume is actually longer than my professional resume. I am one of those people who they love in local sections that just can't say no, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. Uh, my main titles that I have right now, I do work in leadership development and what's called regional support to do things such as this in our region to help our members thrive to help our volunteers be more successful in helping you thrive. I also work as educational activities chair up in North Carolina. I am the professional activities committee for engineers, a PACE chair back in my section. I also started an embedded systems special interest group because IEEE didn't have an embedded systems thing. Always think outside the box and be willing to do so. IEEE is very uh, adaptable to that and there's a lot of things that we do. If somebody comes up with a new idea, IEEE will accept it and they'll actually work with you to you know, bring something new about because it's members such as you, people such as you, who have created all the great things that this organization does. Also work on some project committees to do some of the tools that allow our volunteers to be more effective and also I'm one of the leading trainers out there are the volunteers and I'm part of the group that we call the Center for Leadership Excellence. I have been a consultant off and on since about 1982, 83, um, and when I first started consulting, my job was actually working for a company, which was my agent, if you will, that would go out and get us communications jobs. I traveled all over the world doing communication systems for uh, foreign governments as well as for the U.S., but mostly for visiting dignitaries that would come to the U.S. This was back in the Reagan administration, he was out there courting all these countries for military bases, and so we had all these kings and presidents and what have you come to the U.S. And who handled their communications? It was our group. I was a consultant, but I was working for another company. But every time I'd say a consultant, someone would always say, oh, you're an employed engineer. And stuff. So that's kind of the joke that's out there, and it's a stigma that you're going to have if you're looking about being a consultant. Now, a lot of you, if you are unemployed or look, facing that, and you want to work by yourself, for yourself, for some short period of time, more power to you. And if you're actually really looking for a job and probably looking more for contract type work or something to tide you over, again, more power to you. What I'm talking about when I say consulting or being a consultant is someone who's made the leap. I have cut all my bridges. I am not going to go work for anybody else knock on wood ever again except for myself and my clients because that's where I want to be. We talked about what makes you happy. You know, what is going to make you satisfied with your job? My satisfaction with my job is that I can get in my car and I can drive to Orlando, I can get in my car from North Carolina and I can drive to New York. Notice I don't like flying that much. Or I can get on an airplane, I can fly to San Diego because that's where a client is that I want to go work with. I have that freedom right now, and it's exciting to have that. You know, I have worked in cubicles before. I know what a cubicle's like, and I don't ever want another cubicle personally myself. But it's this thing about you know being unemployed is funny or not. If you're going to start a permanent consulting business, you need some traits, you need some skills, you need some resources. You need to let people know that you're serious. The facts about small business. We've been talking about you know starting new businesses in here. Three million strong, we're the strength of the nation's economy. The future of the U.S. is in small business. It's going to create 39% of the country's gross national product. Two out of three new jobs are going to be with small businesses. It's not going to be with the Rockwells. It's not going to be with the, you know, the huge companies, with the IBMs. It's with the small companies. It's going to produce two and one-half times as many innovations per employee. I worked for 10 years with a group of only 10 people we worked in very high-tech things. That's when I was doing work for the space program. Some of you may remember the Freedom Space Station that was supposed to go up there. I'm not going to ask for hands, but someone here may have actually been involved with that. I was involved with that project. We worked on the robotic arm. It was for that. Well, it was a nice project. I really wish it flung, but 
you know, we got paid. So, you know, but our country lost out on some things, but I'm not going to get into politics. But our small group had, in a period of 10 years, about 65 patents out of only 10 people. That's a lot. I just wish that we could have made all of them into money, because then I'd be here as an independently wealthy guy, and I could, you know, be down here all I wanted to. And I probably would be living here. Some other facts out there, and this is the downside, or the upside, whether you want to look at it. You got a 50% chance of success over the first two years. You notice I didn't say 50% chance of failure. You'll hear that a lot. But you got a 50% chance of success. I prefer to look at it on that way. You know, if I think I'm going to fail, then why do I want to start? Because you've already failed, right? Positive attitude in this. To succeed or fail in your business is under your control. Now, there are some other things out there with others. If you can't get clients that people don't pay you once you do the work for them, and other issues that are totally out of your hands, yes, you can fail, and it is out of your control. But about 80 to 90 percent, in my view, of all of my work that I've ever done has been, it is my job, it's my control. So if I work hard, I'm going to get something out of it. If I slack off, I'm definitely going to feel the pain of slacking off. You know, it's up to me to do it. It's up to the people I work with to do it. If I have a small group of people I'm working with, those of us who work with large companies, we know, you know, that's not always the case. You know, it's not dependent on you. You're just part of the, the team, and you can work your butt off, not get anything out of it, or, you know, you might be one of the ones who's, you know, like in Dilbert, the Wallies of the world. Everybody here watch reach Dilbert, right? Although, as engineers, my problem with Dilbert is it's too true too often. <laughs> right? Okay. I'm the guy with the coffee cup, but I'm not quite Wally. But again, the rewards can be fantastic, and it's not just financial rewards. I'm happy. I don't always get paid. I do make enough money. American Express does know my telephone number. But I'm happy with my work. The rewards can be great in this, and the cost of failure can also be great. It depends on how you finance. It depends on if you can organize yourself, if you have the traits we're going to be talking about. You got to have a plan to get started with this. How many in here, and you don't have to raise your hands, a rhetorical question, would actually go out and build a house, design a circuit, write some code without some plan to go by? Hopefully none of you, although unless you're really, really good and stuff. I mean, I know people who build houses, okay, let's get a piece of wood and nail it together there, and somehow it works because they've done it a thousand times. Well, unless you've done a successful career a thousand times, you're probably not into that boat. You've got to have a plan. A career, whether it's working for yourself or working for somebody else, is something that you and only you should be the one to manage that. And you have to treat it like the most important project that you're ever going to have in your life. You've got to have a business plan to, to help go by to start that business in there. First off, those of you who have been with large corporations as contractors or what have you, we've all been through these exercises. Let's go out and create a vision. And a mission statement, right? Anybody here ever go to the you know re weekend retreat just to write one sentence? I've been there, man. I loved it. Oh yeah, ropes and courses, all that mess. And we came out with the best vision and mission statement. Did we follow it? Well, that's another story. But you need to have your vision and your mission for your career and for your business that you're going to start. What's the means to get there? You know, I could have a vision. I'm going to make a million dollars and I'm going to be richer than Bill Gates. Yeah, but do I have the means to get there? Right now, I don't. How can I get that? Well, you know, that's, if everybody in here knew that, well, we'd all be richer than Bill Gates, right? You have to have the tools. You know, we're engineers. We have to have tools, right? We go out there and we get those tools to do things, whether you're writing code, whether you're designing circuits, or whatever it is you're doing as part of your work. But you've got to have the tools, the material, including money. It does take money to make money. You've got to pay bills when you get started. Unless you've got clients who are just throwing money at you right to start with, then some of people are that lucky. But most of us were not when we got first started out. You had to go out there and knock on doors. You had to go out there and network with people. All the things that you've been hearing about how to get a job is how you start marketing. You need to have milestones. You need to have benchmarks. You have to know when it's time to, to stop cutting bait and start fishing. You have to know when it's time to stop. Because I have seen too many people drive themselves into the ground saying, you know, let's try it one more month, one more month, one more month. And the credit cards are doing this, the line of credit. Everybody remember lines of credit? They used to exist. Uh, so if, I mean, a lot of them went away in the last two years. But you've got to know where you need to be in order to 
gauge your success in there, just like for any other type of project in there. So number one trait that I almost skipped over there, you've got to have great organizational skills. If you can't organize yourself, if you can't keep yourself straight, now that doesn't mean that you, have, you can't use tools to do so. If Microsoft Outlook starts working on my computer, I do not know where I'm going tomorrow. I'm sorry, that's just me. You know, Microsoft Project is my friend because that's how I manage my project. So, I mean, you don't have to be able to do everything in your head, but you need to be able to use the tools to get these things out there and keep yourself organized. Remember, if you're going to start a business, whether it's as a consultant, whether you're starting a new entrepreneurial thing, you've got this new idea for something that you had an idea or something that you can license, and you're going to go out there and make this new product, it's the next whiz bang gizmo, and you're going to start a company to make it, how are you going to finance that? How are you going to eat? How are you going to pay your bills? There's some interesting things that you're going to learn. We talk about how you organize a business, and we start talking about LLCs and corporations. A corporation has to pay you. A corporation has to pay you some salary. Now, that can be a dollar a year like Lee Iacocca did one time with Chrysler, but it's still got to pay you a salary. You've got to come up with that money, so you've got to have enough money to pay you. If you've got employees, your employees aren't, probably aren't going to work for free on speculation for the first six months. Or if they're willing to, let me, I, you know, I might want to come borrow them for a while. How do you pay for your insurance? Where's one of the greatest places in the world to get insurance? IEEE. Remember, IEEE has insurance programs, and they are very cost effective. Those of us who are a little bit of uh, aged people, AARP is another source. I mean, there are lots of good sources out there, but you got to know how you're going to pay for these things. What kind of insurance do you need? Well, of course, health insurance is helpful, but what about liability insurance? If you're going to be doing consulting work, if you're going to be doing anything, it doesn't have to be life safety equipment. I mean, it could be something as simple as making a cell phone. If somebody hurts themselves with that cell phone, what are you going to do? And stuff. So there are many blanket policies out there for small businesses. What are your plans for contingencies? You know, I've had seen a lot of people say, well, I'm going to lean back on my IRA because I've got this big fund out there. Well, what happened to that big fund about two years ago? You know, mine just disappeared and stuff. It uh, went to about one-fourth of its original size because, hey, I was in high-tech stocks. Who knew? And stuff. So, trait number two is good financial planning. You've got to be able to balance your checkbook. You've got to know where the money's coming from and where it's going to in order to start a business. And what's your support structure? If you have a family, what does your family think about this? I'll tell you what my wife thought about it. You're crazy. But right after I you know, pitched this to her and said, okay, I want to do this, she said, okay, if you're going to start a business, I am too. Bless her heart, she's about three times more successful than I am right now with her business. It's a good thing because if Adam dropped out of engineering, she's in the healthcare industry, healthcare industry kept on going and stuff. And so, you know, I'm living off her, but she says, okay, you time running out on this. But still, what is your support structure? How are you going to get through this? What does the family think about this? If they don't support you, spouse, kids, parents, Grandparents, uncle, whatever, you know, the people who you have to, to, to depend on, maybe friends. It may be the people in this room. My support structure is my extended family, and my extended family includes my friends in IEEE, and I'm very upfront with them about that. So, again, look at that. Do you have friends that are successful? If not, go find some. Latch on to them, because that is where you get your mentoring. That's where you learn from. And we'll talk about some places that you can find some of these people that have been successful and stuff. For people who've been unsuccessful and you can learn from them. I always love being a bad example. Not new bad examples, but I mean, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes when I've been doing this. And you're learning from these mistakes today. These are the people that you want to latch on to. If you're using family money, I mean, you've got to rent your uncle and says, okay, I'll give you $100,000 to start your business. What's the expectations of that $100,000? Be sure you know. I mean, family's family, but money's money too. So, you know, be careful of those things. And if you have a mentor and no source for one, if you don't, I will talk about a number of great ones out there. SCORE, people within IEEE, a lot of the organizations I'm going to be talking about within IEEE USA. So trait number three is finding that support structure, that thing that's going to help you get through things. Because I can tell you, stress is going to be there. And that's one of the things that you'll see on that sheet, that handout, that I'll talk more in there. Uh, and what you're going to read later on and what I talk about in the, the, this uh, talk today is the fact that if there is going to be stress, you have to be able to handle that. I mean, things are not always going to go your way. I'm sorry, you know that. 
and stuff, and you're not going to have the boss or you know coworkers or whatever to lean back or or to bl better yet blame them. Time commitment. Some infomercials claim that you can be successful for working only half time. I'll attest that that is true. Half of 24 hours is 12 hours. That's a, probably a good, pretty good work day. And some of you already knew that working for someone else, but I can tell you right now, working for yourself, I don't have anybody else who's going to pick up the slack if I don't work, how many hours it takes to get work done. Be ready to dedicate that time in there. How are you going to get that done? Mow the grass, you know, help wash the dishes, cook dinner, all the things that you might be needing to do when you get home. Uh, or those of us who work from home, you know, do continuously during the day. And that's always the fun of working at home is that you're expected, uh, whether you're, you're male or female, that you're going to be doing all of the housework while you're doing the work and things that you have to manage. That's why I'm so glad to move out of the house. But again, time management skills are another big part of this and stuff. So it's something to keep in mind. You have to have that vision of success. We all remember the old phrase, see the ball. You know, my favorite thing is bringing that up from, I think, the old movie Caddyshack. You know, see the ball, be the ball. You have to have that vision to be able to see that ball going into the hole in a game of golf, to see that baseball going out over the wall to hit a home run, to see your business succeed. If you can't see your business succeed, who's going to see it for you? And how's it going to happen? Unless you're really, really lucky. And I can tell you, I haven't been that lucky. I have to see these things. I have to go after them. So you have to have that vision in there. Trait number five in here is having that vision, having a dream. I have a dream. That was an extremely powerful statement that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made. I have a dream. I love that statement. I listen to it at least once a year. And I should listen to it more often, but I do recite it. Because I have a dream for my business. And unless I work toward that dream, seeing that big picture of where I want to be five years, ten years from now, so what is an entrepreneur? We're talking about all these terms in here. We've been mentioning entrepreneurship a good part of today. Always go to the dictionary here. Thank heavens all of them are online, so I don't have to go find a book. But according to Merriam-Webster, it's he, one who organizes, manages, or assumes the risk of a business or enterprise. Well, that sounds pretty dry in there. Um, but again, it's one who organizes. Organizational skill. Manage. You have to have the time management, the financial management in there. Risk assumption. Remember I told you things are not always going to go right. You have to be able to assume the risk because nobody else can be blamed for it other than you. Even if it's the client's fault, sometimes you have to be able to take the blame and step up and say, I'm sorry, you know, I'm taking on some of this risk. Sometimes you have to eat things, yes, that's true. Um, but again, good management skills will help get you away from that. We talk about consultants, we talk about entrepreneurs. In my book, every consultant is an entrepreneur. If you're going to be an independent consultant, you are out there doing the things that an entrepreneur is doing. You're doing the organization, you're doing the management, you're doing the risk assumption, the risk analysis, you're handling the risk out there, working for your clients. But entrepreneurs are not necessarily consultants. If I want to start a business, build something, I'm not being a consultant, I'm being an entrepreneur. I am starting a new business, I am bringing new jobs. Uh, that's the goal that many of us want to have. Um, I state that I'm a consultant. I also have a training business, which I talk about off and on through this. And part of my training business, my goal 10 years from now is to be the one who sits back in the office. I'm going to send other people out to do my training work for me. So when I get on a plane, it's to go maybe you know do some marketing or you know market down in Jamaica. Jamaica is a great place to market, folks. Um, trust me on that. Um, Florida is a great place to market. I don't live here. It's a great place to visit. California is a great place. Oregon, all these great places out there I love to go to. I'd rather go out there and not have to work. I'd rather have other people working for me. I'm working toward that goal. That's stuff, but I have to have that vision to see that. A consultant is one who gives professional advice or services and an expert. And I tell you, that is a critical word right there, the last word on that sheet. If you're going to be a consultant, don't be an engineering consultant that can do everything. Because who's going to hire you to be a consultant? They might hire you to be a contract worker. They might hire you to be an employee. But if, unless you have an expertise, no one's going to be looking for you to be doing things. And we'll talk about some of the, the issues in there. So what is a non-consultant entrepreneur? We talk about someone who markets a product or service other than expert subject matter. 
Now, I'm an expert in certain areas. I get hired for that. Medical electronics, Zigbee low power networking. These are things that people seek me out for. And these are the things that I can go out and be a consultant on. I do embedded systems. That's a big generic. Those of you who have worked with microcontrollers or microprocessors, you know, I mean, it's a whole enveloping thing that's in everything. I mean, I'm waiting for the microcontroller toaster out there. I'm sure there's one out there. I just haven't found it yet. But it's always a joke we make is that we're going to have them in the toasters. And we'll also have uh, probably Wi-Fi coming out of the toaster, too. But that's just the way that products are now, right? Everything's gone to, you know, more and more electronics in there. But again, it might be someone who's looking for offering a service or having a sales franchise. Now, I'm not suggesting that an engineer go out and say, start a new Starbucks. I'll probably come visit you if you do. But if you go out and start a Starbucks, that may be what you want. I don't care if you have an engineering degree. If that's what you, your love is to go out there and run, run a coffee shop, more power to you. But don't do it just because you can't get a job as an engineer, because there are opportunities out there. The manufacturer is something new or novel. There's always lots and lots of IP out there. Everybody knows what IP is, right? Intellectual property. A lot of ideas, a lot of inventors, as we used to call them. Someone who comes out and comes up with new ideas. Our group has been touring around looking at a lot of the uh, work that's being done in uh, the simulation and training area that's with the Joint Army-Navy uh, force here. We went out and talked to the University of Central Florida. There's lots and lots and lots of intellectual property out there that needs to be made into products. So there's a lot of stuff out there that's opportunities for you. Offering some service. My old dream long ago up in North Carolina's beaches, very few of them had community Wi-Fi. And I always thought, hey, it'd be cool to go live at the beach and go out there and maintain, you know, say, a community Wi-Fi system as appears to have, you appear to have right here, and go out there and manage that system. And so I started realizing what the logistics were, and I talked to someone who's actually in the business, and it no longer became a dream of mine. But what can you do to fulfill your dream of having that filling job to where you're the boss? Now, I talk about consulting. When I consider consulting for real, what I do for a living, I'm not a consultant because I want to go work for the next company. To me, my company is the next company. I want to be out there to be of service to other companies. If you want to take that leap, the best thing you can do right now, and also to keep the hat hunters away, is to actually establish a real business. And when I say real business, it should be registered in some way, shape, or fashion. Um, start an LLC or a corporation. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. You need to talk to a lawyer. You need to talk, talk to an accountant. And that is a step that you cannot skip to do that. But as a savage issue as a business, not a job seeker, I still get headhunter calls every once in a while, but you know what I do? I say, hey, I'm a consultant. I'm a full-time consultant. Here's my areas of specialty. If you ever run into a client who calls you up and is looking for this and they cannot find a proper person, send them to me. I'll convince them how I can be a outside consultant and help outsource that particular need that they have. It works. Not every headhunter will talk to you about that because, again, you know, they have to figure out how they're going to make the commission out of that but it can work in there. Lawyers, accountants are necessary. I won't say necessary evils, but they are necessary. They're part of your business. They are partners in your business. It can be expensive. Thank heavens, I have two nieces and two nephews who are all lawyers. And the two nieces are married to the two nephews. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's two families of two lawyers. I hate to think what goes on in the conversations between two lawyers, but we won't go there. Um, still, that's a blessing for me because I have that to tap into. Everybody here pro bono? Pro bono publicum is essentially mooshing off of your lawyer family. Um, but again, check with resources. You have community colleges. You have local universities. You have this organization called SCORE, a service corps of retired engineers, excuse me, uh, retired executives, wishful thinking, retired executives but SCORE is just what it says. These are executives. These are people who have been successful in business, they've retired, and they want to give back to the community. And they are there as mentors, as trainers, as people who will help you, counsel you in starting a successful business and keeping that business going. So go out and seek out your local SCORE office. I know there's one in Orlando. There's one back in Raleigh. I use them a lot. Again, community colleges, workshops. When you start working with these different entities in here, they do put on free seminars. And many of those free seminars are lawyers, accountants that will come and do free workshops. And sometimes they actually come in and do pro bono work, particularly for startups. So do tap into those resources out there. 
do you need to be licensed? I don't know exactly what the laws are in the state of Florida, but they're a lot like North Carolina. If you call yourself an engineer independently, if you call your business an engineering company, you need to be licensed. And the head of that company has to be a professional engineer, licensed by your state. I'm a PE back in North Carolina. Sorry about that. I'm a PE in North Carolina, but I'm not a PE here because my light, there is no reciprocity between the two states. Uh, North Carolina doesn't like to give anybody stuff, so nobody gives North Carolina. I'm used to that. I come in here, I'm a consultant. I'm not a consulting engineer and stuff, so it's something you have to be careful about how you do that. But licensure does help. It does help you get the best type of liability insurance, et cetera. Yes, ma'am. You have to do. To, to. Hmm. I don't know. I would check into that. I because I'm not familiar with the different states' laws in that. I do know how it works in my state. I'm a PE. I my company is actually a professional corporation, and I. When I had an LLC, it was actually a, a PLLC, a professional LLC, which is the same as a doctor or lawyer. Anyone who is licensed in North Carolina uh, in order to do business, if they form an LLC or form a corporation, actually becomes a professional LLC or professional corporation. And in fact, I don't even go to the Secretary of State who actually handles the typical corporation papers on mine or through the Board of Engineering in my own state. So I would check into what the laws are here and stuff. I'm sorry I can't speak to uh, what you do here. But it is something to look at. It is something that gives you credibility. Oh, yes. Uh, particularly for those of us who don't have, say, a PhD or something after our, our name, having some initials out there really does help. Particularly if you're going to go after folks such as NASA, whatever they're still going to be doing, uh, going after the Army, Navy uh, offices here, a lot of the research is going on here. It does help to have that credibility out there. Uh, stuff. I mean, if, if you've never done, say, the, the first stage of the test, what used to be called the EIT, I think it's called something else now. I took my license so long ago, I, I think the rules have changed a hundred times since then. But again, let's go back and talk about some of these issues in here, because the next thing on here is marketing. Who here thinks that marketing equals sales? Good. It was a trick question, right, isn't it? But marketing and sales are two very, very different things. Marketing is an understanding and approaching your market. What is your market? I work in low power wireless systems. These low power wireless systems are now an integral part of such things as the smart grid, which is the new hot topic that everybody's looking about and the government's spending trillions of dollars on right now. Things such as medical. Everybody's getting older. All those baby boomers are starting to get toward geriatrics. And people are, you know, getting too fat. We get diabetes, we get all kinds of medical issues right now. They just predicted a few days ago that within, I think it's 10 years or 20 years, that one third of all Americans are going to have diabetes. Diabetes care, diabetes uh, uh, diagnostics, etc., going to be a huge business. Unfortunately, I mean, I'd rather it be health equipment and treadmills and things, you know, for us to start getting in shape. I'm working toward that, you know, but it's still that is an issue out there that things are going to have to be uh, done. There are markets out there for you to go in. But who's going to buy your services? If I'm out there doing that low power, then who am I actually talking to? It's not the end users, of course, but what companies out there are looking for those services? What is my market that I can go and try to sell to? Who are they buying from now? Why should they buy from you? That's the first question they're going to ask you. Why should they use my services? When there's a guy, you know, maybe down the street from here, maybe somebody in this building right, right now, also could provide some of the same services. You need to know that. We talked about elevator speech. You think it's not important if you're an independent business person? Oh, yes. My elevator speech, I think, is probably, to me, 10 times more critical than it ever was when I was looking for work. Because, I mean, that's my livelihood. If I can't get on an elevator with you and by the second floor have you understand what I do, and if you're someone looking for that service to understand, I might be a good choice of someone to talk to beyond that. Is it because I beat them over the head and say, stick me? No, I don't. That's not how you do it. That's not how you get someone to help you work together to find a job. You know, tell me about yourself. How can I help you? 
Don't go up to someone and say, give me money, give me a job. You're not going to get anything right. So how do you find this out? Where do you research a potential market? There's lots of great classes out there. I recommend them. I mean, I could talk for the entire day on these things, and I don't have, but uh, how much time do I have left? Four minutes? Okay, we're going to start going a little bit faster here. But do you have potential clients from past jobs? You're all getting good information, right? I haven't seen anybody not off yet. I'm still trying to work on that. But when you leave your job, do you have a, a contract that you sign with the company that hired you? A lot of us have employment contracts. Engineers sign these more and more and more. Large companies love them. I mean, mine, my lawyer had to look at because the sucker was, you know, seemed like it was that thick. And I still have companies I worked for long ago that I cannot, still cannot do anything to compete with them. And I mean, that's the things that you have to watch out for. I mean, we talk about legal problems. One of the legal problems that you're always going to potentially run into is former employers and stuff if they're still around there. Got to find that niche. Like I said, if you're just a general great engineer, you probably find a good job, but being a consultant, starting a new company, maybe not. Great musical from long ago. Gypsy had a great song say, you got to have a gimmick. I love that song. I love that title. I love that thought. you got to have that unique thing to go out there and market yourself. Same thing for helping you get a job, even if you're not looking for consulting or being an entrepreneur. Knowing what that is is going to be your foot in that door. What are you really great at? I don't care if it's making Gantt charts or writing documentation or you know, designing the best circuit, the fastest code, whatever. What's going to get you to that point? You need to be the rather than one of. If you're one of the gang, then you're going to be fighting with everybody else. You're going to be in that school of fish out there trying to get that little stuff. Or you're going to be the shark that when it comes in, everybody clears out because you've got a clear path. You know, be the shark, don't be the little minnow out there. Look at your resume, look at your experience. Again, look at what turns you on, what gets you excited. What's the first thing you want to think about that has to do with engineering when you get up in the morning? What do I really want to do? I want to go out there and talk to people. You can't tell that from being up here, of course, but I want to go out there and talk to people. I want to impart knowledge. I want to help them. I want to make them successful because I know it's going to make me successful. So look at what you can do, what you're able to do, what you want to do. Look at the market trends. Be very specific. You know, right now we're talking about smart energy and green. Well, smart energy and the smart grid and stuff gets bandied about. Well, what are we really talking about? If you don't know, wouldn't try to get into it right now. You need to be out there and be able to say that say something is an energy loss reduction expert, not that you're a green engineer. To me, a green engineer means somebody right out of school, right? You have to be able to sell yourself. We've talked about that all day today. We're going to continue to talk about it when we start talking about resumes and interviewing. You've got to be able to sell yourself. Whether you're looking for a job, whether you've got a business, you've got to be able to sell yourself. Engineers do not make the best salespeople in the world, although I do, do know some that have become that way. And there are a few rarities where you have someone who's great at both. But that's something that's always the old joke, we can't spell, we can't sell. You know, that's the thing that makes up an engineer. And I'm, I'm guilty of that. It's something I had to learn, something I have to sometimes outsource. But what's the uh, re return on investment of the different sales tools out there? Because people are going to be throwing things at you. You start a business, so you're going to be hit by every marketing uh, consultant, every marketing company out there in the world. Trust me, you will. Your email box will start, inbox will start filling up with all of these. But they're going to be selling you direct mail, websites, directories, cold calling, net and they will not be selling you this last one. I'm here to sell you on the last one, networking. I get my clients from things such as this, and I'm totally unabashed about it. You notice I threw an entire slide up there that told you what I do. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't, you know, it's not something I just brag about myself. I do, but something that I brag about myself, it's so that people know who the heck I am. Because there might be somebody out there, there might be something that you talk to tomorrow at the grocery store, at the you know, house of worship, at wherever that you are, out there in the park where the people are out there with the kids playing right now. Someone out there who might be looking for what you can provide for them. But networking is still number one in almost all areas. I'll quickly go through. Most of you have been working with government contractors or 
of course, NASA is part of the whole government complex here. A lot of money to tap into, a lot of companies making a lot of money, but the ones who are making the biggest money are the ones who are out there trying to sell you on how to sell to the U.S. government, right? We all remember Mr. Lesko, who used to do the infomercials, right? He had the big colorful coat on there, wanted to sell you his book, learning how you can get free money from the U.S. government to start a business. I've got a little bit of secret for you. SBA, Small Business Administration, does not give one single penny away to anyone to start a for-profit business. I'm sorry. It's one of the biggest myths out there. Now, if you want to start a nonprofit, maybe so. But again, I want to start a for-profit business. I'm not going to be able to go to the U.S. government. They're not going to just throw money at me. Thank you. I'm going to have to come up with some way to where I can get that money, get paid, provide a service to the government. The government's got a lot of money right now. Sometimes it seems like the only ones have got the money right now, and of course they seem to be putting it in places other than where I wanted to go, but that's not, you know, we're not going to talk politics right now and stuff. Know the facts, know how to move forward. If you want to be a direct salesperson out there, first thing you need to know is ccr.gov. Uh, the contracts, uh, Central Contractors Registry, I believe is the proper term for it, but CCR allows you to get registered register your company, register your consulting business, whatever you have, you get what's called a cage code, you go out there with the SIP codes, that's the special, the, uh, the interest codes, in other words, the areas of expertise that you're working in, uh, get to know FBO.gov and all the other uh, websites out there, again, people like SCORE, your local community college system, local uh, universities around here are very, very good resources. I mean, the ones here, the ones that say, and Daytona, Melbourne, Orlando, you've got lots and lots of good resources here. I don't stick with my home county. I go to all the different counties around my home county and look at all the resources around there because some of them are great in some and weaker in others. But between all of them, I can find the information I need to do these things. But again, there are sites out there. If you start going through these sites and someone says, okay, we need money to get you registered. We need money to get you on schedule. Everybody knows about GSA schedule, right? We've heard of GSA schedule. You know, and everybody out there wants to sell you how to get on schedule, how to be an 8A. I got news for you. Getting to be an 8A is not a piece of cake, but hiring a company to do it is not necessarily going to get you there. Uh, so it's something that you need to watch out for. If you qualify to be an 8A, it's a very straightforward process, and there are contractors that will help you. And I'm talking about the contracting officer, the project managers within the government that will help you with that. Uh, again, getting on schedule is... Uh, it's not paying someone to do it. If you're experienced in R&D, many of you are, if you are used to high tech, and if you can float your own expenses for six to 12 months, I don't know if any of you are actually involved, say, with outside contractors coming in through SBR or STTR. NASA has spent a lot of money on over the years. Um, all the other government agencies have spent a lot of money. DOD spends tons of money on that. All of the health agencies spend a lot of money on this. I have made a lot of money over the years working for the U.S. government through these programs. It is great money because it is free money. It's grants. Once you get that money, you don't have to turn around and provide a product. Now, if you don't start doing this, you probably won't get another one. You have to get a track record out there, but it's not something where they're contracting you. They're saying, hi, I've got this wild and crazy idea for this new thingy here, and something that will benefit, say, the space program, we still have one if it's going to be benefiting the uh, military, if it's going to be benefiting public health, et cetera. And you can sell someone on it through your proposal that you send into the government. The money's yours to go out there and do what needs to be done. If you make it through phase one, they'll give you phase two dollars. Phase three, you have to have a partner for, for commercialization. Again, I could do an entire day on that. Again, SBA does not give away money to start or run a business. But they do give you a lot of great things, a lot of good, free advice that's worth a lot of money. They do guarantee loans, especially those of us who get tapped out and stuff, and a bank by itself will not give you money, or excuse me, will not loan you money. They don't give anybody anything. They don't even give away free toasters anymore, but they do give loans out there that you have to pay back. Again, scores out there. Um, they get one-day seminars. Most of the local school offices do at least twice a year. We'll do how to start a business seminar. It costs you maybe 75 bucks. That's a typical cost. And it's pretty much the same all around the country. Get with your local community colleges. Look for someone that's offering the Kaufman Fast Track Tech Venture. If you're a tech company, you really want to do the tech venture or the new venture. 
as a 10 lesson class. It's a crash course on essentially how to run, how to start, how to define, how to run a business that's successful. It's a fantastic program right now. I'm trying to get licensed under IEEE for us to start providing that in Region 3. We're still working on that. Got to learn sales and marketing. It's not optional. You have got to sell yourself. You've got to understand your market that you're going to be selling to. It is absolutely critical. And even though, say, I get a contract or something that's going to tie me through the next six months, am I going to sit for six months and not do anything more to find out what happens the next six months? Mr. Stogner, am I going to do that? Am I? Absolutely. No. If I'm <laughs> no, if, if I have something that's going to tie me over the next six months, am I going to stop selling? Am I going to stop marketing? You can't stop selling. Absolutely. You cannot stop. It's an ongoing, continuous process. It's something that you've got to be ready for that next six months because it may take you six months to get that next one. It often does. And therein lies the challenge of being a consultant. How can I do and make a living and sell that next project? Well, I mean, that's part of the thing about the fact that, you know, you are going to be doing all of the extra work that was being done by admins or something with a large company. I mean, all this has to be done whether you're going to outsource it or do it yourself. I mean, you're not going to be able to bill 100%. We're not like lawyers. Hopefully no lawyers in here, right? Um, I talk about them. I've got relatives that are lawyers. But I know some lawyers who can bill 100 or 110% or whatever the hours that they work. Bless their hearts. Typical consulting engineer is lucky to bill 50% of the hours that you spend because there is all that overhead and it depends on what has to be done at that time. Learn accounting or hire, well, first off, you need a CPA. You need a good accountant to back up your work, but it helps for you to learn accounting to take care of the day by day until you can afford to hire one yourself. Great questions to ask yourself. Are you a self-starter? Can you get yourself out of bed in the morning and get going or do you have to, well, you know, da, 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 da. I can tell you one thing, that is something I had to overcome because I am not a morning person. I am a night person. <clears throat> I work a lot at night. That's fine. When you're a consultant, you can work whatever hours you want to, as long as your spouse doesn't get overly upset about that. How do you feel about other people? You know, engineers tend to be, if you ever go through Myers-Briggs and stuff, tend to be introverts more than often. You know, is it, are you comfortable going out there and walking up to someone in this room, introducing yourself? and talking about yourself. If you can't do that, how are you ever going to get someone to hire your services or buy your products? I mean, something that you have to overcome in there. Can you lead others? Are you a leader? If you can't lead, you can't inspire. If you can't inspire, you can't get things to happen. So it's something that you need to look at. Can you take responsibility? Who's, who is to blame if something happens? You are, right? Unfortunately, that's the case. So half the time it's my clients, but still, I'm the one who gets blamed, right? Those of us who are married, guys who are married, you know, we know we get blamed all the time. Yes, the, I always have the last word in my house. Yes, dear. Right? And yes, my wife knows I say that. She expects me to say that. How good an organizer are you? Another trait that I had to overcome because I, you don't even want to see pictures of my office. But you have to be able to organize yourself. How good a worker are you? Are you the person who can keep going? A lot of us engineers, you know, we take, get a job and we won't stop until the darn thing gets done, right? Who here has pulled an all-nighter sometime in their life? Oh yeah, you know, most of the group in here because we tend to be tenacious, don't we? We got that problem to solve and dang it, we're going to keep going until we get it done. It's actually a good trait. Makes your life shorter, but it's a great trait. Uh, <laughs> can you make decisions on the spot? You go to a client and the client says, okay, you know, here's all of this, here's all of this, what are we going to do next? And knowing how to answer that question right now and say, oh, I need to go back. Those of you who served in the military, you know that you're not allowed to do that. Someone asks you to make a decision, you got to make a decision right now. Take your year over an officer, you had to be able to do it now and stand by it and live with it. Can people trust what you say? If they can't, you're not going to be successful, particularly not as a consultant, not as an entrepreneur. Because your word is your bond, your word is going to be your company, it's going to live and die by that. And can you stick with it no matter what happens, no matter how bad things get, no matter how much you just want to run off and come down to the beach or go down to Jamaica, which is another great place to go. No, you have to be able to stick with it. You have to be able to be in there and be tenacious about it. Can you keep good records? Another thing I'm weak at, thank heavens I have two daughters who are really good at filing and being able to help with that. Come tax time, I go kidnap them and bring them back home because my kids are growing up and live away from home. Alternatives, if you have weaknesses in there, many of us do, I do, 
And I'm still able to be successful as a consultant because I understand my weaknesses. I'm able to look at myself and understand those things that I need help in. If you can understand your strengths and your weaknesses, everybody remember SWOT? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. You need to do a SWOT analysis of your ability as an engineer, your ability as, as an entrepreneur. Even if you're going to be looking just for a job, know what your strengths and weaknesses are because you're going to be asked that in interviews. You're going to find out a little bit later. If you can balance your spot weaknesses, if you need someone to help manage you, if you need someone to help you with accounting, if you need someone to help you with organizational skills, then you may need to go out and make that part of your business plan. Know that I'm going to have to have a half-time accountant, that I'm going to have to have an office manager, I'm going to need someone who can you know, get after me with that bull whip and keep me going and stuff. Remember that you can do that. You don't have to be the person who does everything, but you have to recognize that from the very beginning. Alternatives out there. If you're facing a current unemployment or impending unemployment, you're not really sure that you want to be a consultant the rest of your life. There are things that are what I consider temporary consulting. This is getting back to what I consider the old joke, but it's a, re a reality out there, is there are things that you can do temporarily. Not you know totally burning your bridges like I did, but going out there and being a consultant for now. Go out there and find clients, do work for them. Whether it's contract work or consulting work, there is a difference. Contract work typically is set for the hours. Sometimes it happens at the other place. It used to be the definition between W-2 and 1099. Of course, the IRS has blurred those distinctions in there because it depends on where you do the work, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you'll need to talk to a good corporate lawyer. Best way to find them, again, is go to SCORE, go to your local community college because typically they'll find someone who will give you some pro bono advice and it is worth something more than the free that you pay for it. Contract works out there, um, local pools and companies, being an independent contractor, I've worked in both of those environments and they're fine. I'd rather be exactly where I am. But if you are still looking for a job and get a temporary contract, that doesn't mean that you stop. Just like you don't stop selling your company if you're an entrepreneur, you don't stop selling yourself. You need to go out there and continuously drive, 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 looking for where you're going to be landing later on there. I talked to a moment about consulting versus contract. You can read the slides in here. Just keep in mind that if you are consulting, you're not going to be billing 100%. So when we talk about setting fees, um, you know, it's not going to be like you're going to make the same number of hours, per, uh, it's the same number of dollars per hour that you would make equivalent being an engineer working full time for a company. A lot of your potential clients think you can. If you're working a job that would typically pay, say, $100,000 a year, which comes out to roughly $50 an hour, they think, oh, I can hire a consultant for $50 an hour. A lot of companies out there think that's the case. It ain't the case because I can't bill 40 hours a week. And if I'm only work $50 an hour to them, I might as well go work for them. As a consultant, I need to be worth more. And so that's something to keep in mind out there. Again, taxes and licenses, don't forget your local licenses. If you're gonna start a business, you know, the state of Florida, your local uh, um, uh, ordinances out there, privileged licenses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just like the local uh, Starbucks has to have a privileged license, chances are, I don't know the state of Florida's laws, but I know in North Carolina, I have to have the same privileged license that a Starbucks does in order for me to have my consulting business. So it's something you need to look at out there. Of course, the tax filings, et cetera. What's the support? Now, I've been talking about all these things, and oh, well, there's a lot that you need to worry about. Yes, there is. I've thrown a lot at you in the last hour. There is a lot of support in IEEE. IEEE Consultants Networks. That is through IEEE USA. If your local section does not have a consultants network, it's time to start one. Start talking to your local IEEE volunteers about hey, we need one of those and stuff and see if you can't get them to do it. You have my email address on the second page of my handout. If you have any problems with that, contact me. Now, I have been charged with by our regional director to start a new support mechanism here in the southeast for consultants, entrepreneurs, and also for innovators. And we're going to be working at building up local resources on that. If you're interested in that, email me. You're also probably going to see mention of that Oh, I know you will be seeing a mention of that on our two um, uh, URLs, the top and bottom one there. There are three jobs, and there will also be a thing there on our online community, uh, region3ocitriplee.org, at least as a root directory. Um, entrepreneurs networks for people who want to start an entrepreneurial business, say creating a service or a product out there. Again, I just mentioned Region 3 Entrepreneurs and Innovation Network, which is not started yet. We're still working on the framework for it getting that old vision, mission statement part going in there.
but that's going to be coming very soon. So that would be a support thing out there. Just remember, you are the boss. You're ultimately responsible, but you're not alone. This is a network. You're going to hear that all day long. You've been hearing it all day long. We are a network. This is the IEEE network. It is not electronic. It's not emails and stuff. It's people and people and people and people and stuff. And we're there to help you succeed and help each other succeed. Again, I mentioned the resources in there. You have these slides in there. Again, there's another shot with my, uh, I believe this is different from what's in the book, but again, you have my email address on that second sheet of the handout. And with that, any questions? Yes, sir. We have a question from Richmond. Yes, sir. The question is, of course. how long did it take for you to become a legitimate business? Uh, don't ask my wife that because she'll tell you it hasn't happened yet. My interpretation <laughs> yes. is, um, how long for to be a legal business? Legal business took me less than a month. Uh, my first, well, actually, I was a DBA, do business, uh, doing business as, uh, which was not an LLC or a corporation. Early on that, filing the papers for that, it's like a day. Uh, essentially, it's reserving the name of the company with the Secretary of State and with the local entities, et cetera. The second stage in there is if you're going to do an LLC, uh, limited liability company, everybody understands what an LLC kind of is, right? Again, go consult a lawyer. Um, it's worth every penny, but LLC in the state of North Carolina took me essentially again I registered the name, I did an application, and the whole process took less than a month just for the paperwork to come back. Corporation actually took about the same amount of time. Now I incorporated without a lawyer being involved because I knew, well again, I have family, so I knew what I needed to do. I, for someone who's not familiar with the process, I don't recommend doing that. So again, so, any other questions? Yes, sir. For the SDI grant, talking about uh, not getting a full profit business. So, how that works, you can tell me what kind of identity you are applying for. Say, personal name or non profit organization? How that works? You need to be an established business for the SBR program, mainly because the, the, the government entity that's paying this money out has to account for you. Uh, so, it, it, I mean, to start a brand new business today and try to do an SVR application tomorrow would be difficult because you don't have any track record. Um, having some track record, not necessarily with other government agencies, but with some business or, you know, essentially being able to have a business reference. Same thing if I have a new client come, but they say, well, who have you done other work for that's willing to vouch for you? Um, so, I mean, it is a process. It's, uh, again, there's a lot of paperwork involved. I would check with the, um, the uh, small business development, I believe is what's called, it's called here in Florida. In North Carolina, we have the Small Business Technology Development Center, SBTDC of North Carolina, which is all, has SBIR uh, consultants and experts that will help a small business get into that program. It is a long process, but it is very rewarding because you get to do some really, I mean, way out there type stuff. And again, it doesn't have to come to product you want it to, of course. You know, we don't do it just to get the project and go get another project. I know some project junkies out there love to do that. I'd rather create a new product to where I can live off of and retire. Any other yeah. questions? Thank you. We're done. <laughs>